every single government is talking about this. This is an issue even my mom and dad talk about, right? It's something that's on the kitchen table of people all over the world. Our knowledge is really um, more comprehensive than anyone else. Hello colleagues and hello everyone listening in. My name is Laura Madori. I'm the head of the Innovation and Knowledge Management Unit. This podcast episode is a special treat as we catch up with two formidable leaders in IOM, our Director General, Amy Pope, and our Director of Interim for the Department of Data Insights and Policy Coordination, Michelle Klein Solomon. Thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. So let me set the scene for this conversation. As IOM, we operate in an increasingly complex migration landscape with unprecedented crises, uh, displacement, climate crisis, and geopolitical changes. IOM has a pivotal role in leading the conversation and the action to support migrants and displaced communities. IOM also plays a critical role in harnessing the potential of migration as a key driver for sustainable development. One of the significant milestones of IOM this year has been the launch of the IOM Strategic Plan 2024-2028, which aimed to strengthen IOM's role as a global uh, actor and knowledge broker to save lives and protect people on the moon, drive solution to displacement, and facilitate regular migration pathway. Internally, IOM has also been um, undergoing a strategic restructuring to better serve migrants and strengthen our coherence and impact across our organization. One of the results of the restructuring has been the establishment of our new Department of Data Insights and Policy Coordination. Um, and this is to enhance our capacity so to support the development of right-based and evidence-based policies, but also to provide data, analysis, knowledge, research on migration, and also innovative programming. So thank you very much, Didi and Michelle, to be here. Um, so first of all, let me talk to you, to you Didi. Um, first of all, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Since you took the office October last year, so many changes have happened and uh, the organization has accomplished so much in such a short period of time. You're also the first woman ever to become DG of the IOM, so congratulations again for this. Thank uh, you. But with these dynamic changes and uh, it has, must be quite a ride for you. It's a great ride. I mean, <laughs> the exciting thing about what we do at IOM is that we're working on something that could not be more relevant. Every single government is talking about this. This is an issue even my mom and dad talk about, right? It's something that's on the kitchen table of people all over the world. Whether and why and how people move, what happens to them when they move, is a topic that is driving public deb debate like never before. And I think that we are incredibly fortunate to be working at IOM at this moment in time. Even though it's not easy, mm -hmm. it does mean that our work is relevant and that's what we all want. Absolutely, this is an extremely relevant migration and especially in the increasingly complex landscape in which we operate. Now turning to Michelle, we know you recently took up uh, the position of director at the interim of the Department of Data uh, Insight and Policy Coordination this year, leading one of the biggest departments resulting from the HQ restructure. How are you enjoying your role? I'm loving it. <laughs> and thanks it's so much. It's really an honor to be here with you, Amy, Director General, and, and thanks, Laura, for putting this together. It's an exciting time, and I'm thrilled about the department. Would you like me to talk a little bit about the department? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's the first time pulling together at headquarters our data analysis, our research, our international migration law, our, our work on the migration governance indicators, together with the IOM Development Fund and our policy knowledge and research uh, components all together. So it means that we effectively have an in-house think tank that can pull together our capacity to really be a thought convener, a leader in shaping the global migration discourse and supporting governments and other stakeholders around the, um, around the world, as you said in your intro with rights-based and evidence-based migration policy. And I, for one, could not be happier about this. This is what I've 
hoped that IOM would do for a very long time, and I'm so grateful to Director General Pope for, for making this possible. My roots in IOM are very much in the policy and research area, but this is the first time where we've had a Director General who is fully behind this vision, drawing on, and in no way in competition with, but very much drawing on IOM's operational expertise around the world. It's time that we have a stronger voice, and this gives us the capacity to do so. Absolutely, it's so important to bring together all these different pillars, the data, the policy, the analysis, the research, and also international migration law and innovation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, uh, turning again to you, Amy, let's delve into the current uh, migration trends and the IOM recently launched World Migration Report 2024, which is such a flagship uh, knowledge and research initiative for IOM. And globally, um, the evidence is clear. Overall, migrants boost sustainable development, and migration represents an important opportunity for building prosperous and resilient societies. Uh, nonetheless, there are also um, significant challenges faced by migrants and displaced population. How is IOM uniquely positioned to respond to this? Well, first of all, as Michelle has pointed out, we have deep capacity, expertise, experience, best practices, knowledge, and data. Better than really anybody else, we can explain and understand why people are moving, what's driving them to move. And our goal here is to come up with policies and practices that are evidence-based and that they're strategic. IOM has a fantastic capacity to respond on the ground to the most pressing needs of people around the world. But what we've realized is that if we stop just at responding and reacting, then we never actually help people move to the next stage where they can really leverage their human potential to deliver on the promise of migration, not just for themselves, but the communities that they're moving to or coming from. So IOM has the ability to work within communities. We have the ability to engage with governments. We have the ability to provide life-saving support, but then also think through how do we enable a community to learn the skills they need for the future? How do we facilitate their ability to get a safe, regular pathway for migration? We can do all of the above. And our roots are deep, are the trust with governments in our capacity is high. Our knowledge could not be um, really, if you look around the world of people working on this issue, our knowledge is really um, more comprehensive than anyone else. So we have all the pieces. You know, Our goal is now to knit them all together into a comprehensive, strategic, data-driven approach. Yes, absolutely. It's so important. Our role is an extremely operational agency, but also it's, uh, we have this deep capacity of influence the global discourse on migration and the policy discussion as well. Now, turning to you, Michelle, what an exciting time for our department with the launch of the World Migration Report 2024, as we just said. And what does the WMR bring to the world? Can you share a few thoughts about the WMR? Sure. What, what's critical, and this is what the Director General just said, is that it's evidence-based, and it's, it's, it's truly expert analysis. This is the, our flagship publication. It's the 12th edition. It comes out every two years. And around migration, we know there's a lot of noise, and a lot of the noise is is myth, it's stereotypes, it's bias. This is an authoritative source based on the best evidence available. We know there's some 281 million international migrants in the world today. That's 3.6% of the world's population, but they contribute more than 9% of to GDP, a, a disproportionate proportion. And, and the, neg the, the story around migration, if you read the news, is often very negative, and it misses the tremendous contributions that migrants make, not only to their host societies, but also to their home societies, most concretely through the remittances that they send home. The projections, I mean, it's actually staggering to look at since 2000 to 2022, how much remittances went up. Now they're more than $860 billion a year, and that is more than official development assistance and foreign direct investment in most cases combined. And those remittances 
are truly the lifeline for families. They put food on the table, they allow access to education, healthcare, housing, and they help create entrepreneurship and growth and development in the home, host, home excuse me, communities as well as contributing to the host communities. Of course, migrants bring much more than that and just the money, but that's just a very concrete evidence of the, of the impact. And so we need to work on changing that negative discourse and that negative narrative because it's really out of lockstep with the reality of migration. That's not to say that there aren't challenges, and of course there are, and in your introduction, you talked about the multiple crises that are taking place around the world, and IOM is there in every crisis on the ground, helping to save lives, helping to drive solutions. But the overall story of migration is that most people actually move through safe and regular means and actually contribute greatly. And in a time, you haven't mentioned yet the demographic shifts that are taking place in the world. It's clear that much of the industrialized world, in fact, almost all industrialized countries are aging and are having fewer children. And that means that lots of jobs are going unfilled while at the same time, and in particular in Africa, we have growing populations, youth populations, and not nearly enough jobs for people coming into the workforce. So it is an absolute necessity to bring people to where there is opportunity, and also to offer protection for those who need it because of vulnerabilities of various sorts. That's, of course, true in the case of refugees, who have, where there's already an established resettlement system, but it's equally true in the context of migrants who experience various vulnerabilities, exploitation and abuse. And now if we compound that with the effects of climate change and seeing uh, the increasing numbers of people who will be affected and displaced by disasters, we, it's time that we really push the regular pathways agenda, and I couldn't agree more with the strategic plan and its priorities. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a, such a transformative aspect of our strategic plan. We're going to go to regular pathway just in one minute. But before that, I would like to turn to one of our favorite topic, innovation. <laughs> <laughs> innovation is crucial to address uh, complex challenges, but it's also crucial in amplifying the benefit that migration can bring to society. Last year, we had a lot of enthusiasm around the IOM Innovation Awards, which is our recognition program in which we celebrated and recognized innovation across the globe, the IOM and partner developed together. Now, we are really delighted that this year, IOM established the first ever IOM Innovation Facility. Um, so we would like to discuss a little bit the facility with you, Emmy. Could you please tell us more about the facility and how it can support our work? So IOM is probably the most innovative agency out there. It's in our DNA. From the very beginning of our history, we have been innovating ways to support people on the move. And it's particularly crucial because, as Michelle pointed out, migrants do not have protections the way refugees have protections. So we need to be thinking creatively about how to address the needs of people who are on the move. So it's built into our DNA, but what we've realized is that we did not have the ways to scale up. So we saw fantastic innovations in a mission in Turkey or in Somalia or South Sudan, but those innovations were not translating into different parts of the world where they could be used and could be relevant and could enable better services. I mean, I think the other thing here that's very noteworthy is that migrants themselves tend to be very innovative. They are people, by and large, who have a broader scope. They tend to be entrepreneurial. They have to dig deep into their own personal capacity to find ways of dealing with some of the unique challenges of being on the move, sometimes under extreme circumstances. So what we're recognizing with the new innovation facility is something that's already baked into our DNA and baked into the DNA of the people we serve. We're now just looking for ways to make it more concrete, to give opportunities for people to innovate, to try, to scale up, and then when relevant, to push it out to the rest of the IOM community. Absolutely, it's so important to be more, much more intentional and strategic in the way that we do uh, innovation. 
Now, turning back to you, Michelle, you mentioned a little bit the connection between the youth and how do we work also with this, uh, with, with youth in IOM. So let, let's talk about innovation policy and the power of youth, which is so important also for innovation. Almost 31% of international migrants are youth and projections tell us that by 2030, Africans uh, will make up 42% of the global youth population. So considering this very important and the large presence of youth, how can IOM support the role in advancing novel and transformative approaches? Thank you for raising that, Laura. And um, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what the DG said about the entrepreneurial spirit of migrants. I mean, it's 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 a lot takes a lot to leave your own country, and it is actually the innovators who tend to do so. And the the record on that is is quite striking. For example, the number of patents that are awarded to migrants uh, is is extraordinary. But turning to youth. Um, I'm really happy to see that IOM has created a dedicated focus on engaging youth now and recognizing that not only are youth the future, but as you said, that um, migration will be shaped by youth in the future. And so they need to be at the table. They need to be helping to shape the solutions that they will be driving. So now we have a Youth in a, uh, Innovation Award and, and fellowship, uh, excuse me, um, leadership and innovation and more. And, and we're doing these things obviously in collaboration with others, with UNICEF, with the Migration Youth and Children's Platform. It's super important to recognize the contributions of youth, to make them visible, to empower them, to give them the space to be able to speak at the table and to help shape the solutions that we'll see coming forward. We did that, for example, on the margins of the last Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, where we had a roundtable with youth, for youth, and really looking at the impacts of climate change on youth and how they can in engage as innovators to, to help shape a better outcome for them. So that it's time, and I'm glad that we've, we've really created this focus um, on youth in, in IOM. Absolutely, so important. And now from innovation and youth, now let's turn to innovation and data, mm -hmm. um, which is such an important part of our work as well. How um, is IOM leveraging innovative solution and data analysis tools uh, to improve its humanitarian response, but also the policy advice and support to its various stakeholders? Yes. I mean, this is very much also in line with the Secretary General's uh, Data 2.0 initiative and having our Global Data Institute in Berlin that now includes the displacement tracking matrix, includes the Global Migration Data Analysis Center together, but as part of this overall department allows us to harness that, that data and that data for change. And so a couple of the key things that we're, we're doing now is We've created a migration data portal, and that portal is meant to be an authoritative source for data. It brings not only IOM's data, but a consortium of more than 22 organizations and institutions so that we can people can have immediate access to the latest figures, whether it be about a country, a region, or a theme, and to access that really quickly. We're also the leading organization in tracking and bringing attention to missing migrants. I mean, and this is a phenomena that unfortunately we're seeing around the world. But we've been able through the Missing Migrants Project to bring greater visibility and attention to the, the life-threatening um, harm that many migrants face through irregular journeys. These are, these are just a, a couple of examples. And I, I think, um, we we can do more, we are doing more, and this these need to be absolutely cross-organization-wide efforts. But getting the numbers right is the first start, and it's critical, and, and having GDI, the Global Data Institute, is our best place to start on that. Absolutely. Absolutely, Michelle. Data is so important to shape programming and evidence-based policies and everything that we do, and also, that informing what all the other partners can do with us. 
Um, now, we touched upon uh, before facilitating regular migration pathways, and um, it, this is such a key area of work for our organization, and can enable really a critical shift in the way that we approach safe and orderly migration. Um, can you please, Amy, elaborate a little bit more on what regular pathway entails and what is the role of IOM? And in what specific way do you think uh, or do you envision regular migration pathway fundamentally reshaping the narrative on migration and fostering inclusivity and driving um, sustainable development? So the world needs migration. If you look at the demographics that Michelle outlined, the number of people in terms of job opportunities doesn't match right now, right? In some economies, they simply don't have the workforce. In other economies, they don't have the jobs. That means that people will need to move in order to really achieve efficiencies and prosperity for more people. But right now, the systems that exist are failing. That means that people do not have access to regular pathways, for example, in order to get a job. So increasingly, they're relying on irregular pathways to move. It's not that they're not finding a job. People actually are finding jobs. And in fact, the United States, their economy recovered faster after COVID in large part because of migration. And some, a lot of that migration was irregular migration. So our goal is to take the profit out of the business of smuggling and trafficking and migrants, to set up safe and regular ways for people to move, to create efficiencies between job opportunities and the people who are looking for them, um, and ultimately to drive better economic and social and um, innovative outcomes all over the world. Now, it's not just labor mobility. We know that migrants moving in search of job training or education, migrants who are reuniting with their family, migrants who have protection needs that will not qualify as traditional refugee resettlement, um, and the refugees themselves who are being resettled. All of these are examples of ways that people can move regularly. But the bottom line is being honest with ourselves about the need for migration, being honest with ourselves about the fact that the systems do not work and using the significant experience we have over the last 70 years in helping to move people to create better, more dignified ways for people to move. Absolutely, this is so uh, extremely important for IOM, but also in, for uh, global economy, society, for inclusivity, for diversity is it really what we need. Now let's talk about future plans. Uh, what's on the horizon for both of you? Uh, Michelle, what is next for the department? We have a lot of exciting initiatives going on in the department right now. I mean, we've talked about the World Migration Report, but let me call attention to a few more, and this is just an example. We've just had adopted our first no global knowledge management strategy, and this is, you know, IOM is so well known for its operational expertise. What we often don't do is capture the learnings from that. And with the knowledge management strategy, which will be rolled out throughout the organization, we want to capture the lessons learned, the best practices, not be afraid to say when something didn't work and what could have been done better. It's our chance to really learn from each other and make sure we don't lose the expertise of, of people who are doing the amazing work around the world. A second innovation this year, for the very first time, we're creating an annual policy agenda. And this is drawn from our colleagues in the field who are highlighting where there are opportunities to work with governments and other stakeholders to help both at the national level in developing national migration policies, either comprehensive ones or theme specific like labor migration or countering trafficking and smuggling, whatever it may be, but also regional ones. So for example, I'm just back uh, last night from Trinidad where I was supporting CARICOM, the, the Caribbean community's integration body, to develop their very first regional migration policy. 
Um, it, the, and it comes back to something that Amy said before, which is so important. IOM is truly trusted by member states and by other organizations, which gives us an opportunity to do so much. So the policy agenda is really both a look back at what we've done over the last year. A lot comes from the migration governance indicators assessments and how that feed into government's decisions to adopt policy, but more importantly also a look forward for the next year. And we'll be updating that um, every, every year, and it's drawn from our colleagues from around the world. There are just a couple of other ones I want to call quick attention to because there's so much that's going here. You know the IOM Development Fund has been a massive support to our, our developing country and middle-income country states. It's not an accident that it's placed in this department. Looking back over the last 10 years, the majority of projects that the developing country member states have asked for is to help them develop migration policies. Great to be able to put that together with our other sources. In international migration law, we're helping make governments actually do that translation of international standards and to their national legislation and context, according, of course, to their own priorities, but making sure that they're based on existing international norms. Progress. This is a, an analysis of our DTM data together with Georgetown University, and we're shifting the debate about displacement from when displacement ends to focusing on when solutions start. Which, which needs to be at the beginning of a displacement, because oftentimes the displacement doesn't end and we need to be putting the solutions right together at the outset. And this, of course, lines up with the Secretary General's action agenda on displacement, where IOM is a key, key partner. And we have taken um, special role in, in helping this through our DTM, which is recognized by the humanitarian community as the major source of key informant data on displacement. A last thing I want to mention, and again, this is these are just samplings of things. We're now doing strategic foresight. We want if we have the ability to actually predict, not with 100% certainty, but with a good degree of certainty, where crises of various sorts are going to come, whether they be economic crises, political crises, or disaster or conflict-related crises. And we're drawing together that information, again, from our colleagues around the world on the ground. And six, every six months, we'll be producing a strategic foresight report together with all parts of the House. This will help us to be better prepared in our programming to anticipate where disaster may strike and hopefully be able to save lives by bringing people out of harm's way before disaster strikes and certainly being better prepared in the case of disasters. Thank you, Michelle. Now, Hemi, what is next for our organization? Where are you taking us? <laughs> <laughs> it's an adventure. Um, so IOM has had this amazing trajectory over the last 73 years, right? We started first in responding to one very specific crisis, people displaced after World War II. Today, we're operating all around the world. We have over 520 offices where we're providing support to people who are displaced by conflict or climate change, where we're providing basic humanitarian life-saving assistance, whether it's the war in Ukraine or the displacement of people in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in Haiti. But increasingly, as Michelle has said, we know that if we just respond to people who are displaced and we don't start to think about the next step, we find people can be living in camps, in positions of vulnerability for entire generations. And that's just not acceptable. So our goal, especially when we recognize the impact of climate, when we know how many people are vulnerable to displacement because of climate, we see it as our responsibility to get ahead of that. So as Michelle has outlined, we're building the capacity to identify communities who are the most vulnerable and to put in place interventions even before people are displaced. And then 
if and when people are displaced, we're thinking from the very beginning, how do we enable them to move on? How do we enable them to build a new life? Whether that means they're starting from their new area of displacement or thinking ahead to the future where they might be able to get a job or be relocated or resettled. So it's bringing a much more strategic approach to the movement of people, recognizing there will always be people who are displaced because of conflict that we can't anticipate and that we just need to be able to get there quickly and provide a blanket, provide some shelter, provide some counseling, but that increasingly that is just not going to cut it and we simply cannot let the status quo reign. So I see IOM as being on the forefront of coming up with new and innovative solutions. I see us as driving the policy agenda. We are no longer just an implementing agency standing by for somebody to tell us what to do. We are uniquely capable of advising governments, partners, other agencies on the way we can put together a much more comprehensive response that will save more lives and ultimately deliver on the promise of migration. I am so glad you said that, Amy, because um, I've been in I with IOM for 24 years, 24 and a half years, and, and I'm getting ready to retire. The change has been extraordinary. The growth of IOM's footprint around the world, the growth of its offer to governments and to other interlocutors has grown. IOM's status and recognition has grown enormously. And with the leadership that we now have, I think we have a unique opportunity to make a real difference. It's, uh, it's our footprint, but it's the leadership and the vision and the commitment and drive. Thank you very much, DG Pope. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's thank great to be here much, with you. Thank you very much, DG. And thank you so much, Michelle, for so many years of service in our organization. So this is such an inspiring conversation. We would love to continue, but we are heading to the very last segment of the mm -hmm. podcast, which is a very exciting one. It's the rapid fire question. Oh. Mm -hmm. And this one um, that we, I really like because we want to also um, have a little bit of more personal touch to the conversation. So it's meant to be very, very quick. And let's mm -hmm. start with Emmy. Um, Emmy, are you more like a early bird or night hall? Oh my goodness. I don't sleep is, I think, the bottom line. Um, I, I, if, I, if I had totally my own control over my life without work, I would stay up late. Um, but I actually find that with the pace of work and um, the, the amount that needs to be done, I, I get up early. And I start by exercising because that sets my mindset for the day. It gives me energy. Um, and frankly, if I don't do it first thing in the morning, then I won't do it later. Now, Michelle, what is the book currently in the United Center? Ooh, Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, I have a great one. I'm so excited. The newest Isabel Allende book called uh, The Wind Knows My Name. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Allende, and this, this is brand new. And I actually picked it up in the airport uh, yesterday, and I'm now two-thirds of the way through it. I, I stayed up and, and read this. Um, she's an extraordinary writer, and this one is a really beautiful one. She, by the way, wrote a fantastic novel about the migration of the Spanish to exactly. Chile. Exactly. It's a fascinating uh, story of migration and integration um, that I think is now little understood or appreciated. And this one includes a migration story as well. Oh, that's fantastic. I love Allende too, it's great. Now the next question, I, I love this question, so I'm gonna ask to both of you. So if you could go back in time and meet your younger self, like your 15 year old self, what is the piece of advice that you, you will give to yourself? To be bold, to not be afraid of what people think. I would never be the director general of this organization if I was governed by what people think. Running for this job was hard and a lot of people did not appreciate that I was doing it. So I had to find the fortitude within myself. I had to know why I was doing it. I had to believe in why I was doing it. When I was 15, that was so much harder. <laughs> Believing, that's a great advice. What about you, Michelle? I, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> but it's true, It's uh, I was a very shy child and uh, if I could, talk to my 15-year-old self, I would tell her, speak up, 
don't be afraid. Speak up. You have something to say. And again, don't worry about what other people think. And as long as you speak from your heart, from your convictions, from your sense of what's, of what's right and, and justice, really pursue that. And, and don't be deterred at all by the naysayers. And don't worry what other people, say, other people think at all. Now, one word to describe your experience in IOM. Oh my God. Uh, wow. <laughs> I don't know. It's energizing. <laughs> and you, Michelle? Rewarding. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. Rewarding. It's been a great pleasure to serve at IOM. Great. And it's such a great pleasure to have you both here. Thank you so much for such an inspiring and rich conversation. And thank you all for listening in. If you want to know more about good practices and lesson learned, please check also our website on knowledge management and innovation. And of course, our POEM platform to look for good practices and lesson learned. Thank you so much for being here with us and continuing leading us with such an inspiration. Thanks for the work you're doing and continuing to focus on the importance of innovation across our organization. And on capturing all the, the knowledge in this organization and make sure that we don't waste time reinventing the world. Thank you, Laura, and thanks to your team, and thank you, Director General. Thank you. Thank you.